Hello, my name is Rick Pearson and this is Prophecy USA, a program specifically designed to unveil the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. You know, our recent Pew Research study claims that close to 40% of American adults believe that we're living in the end times. Certainly, the restoration of God's covenant with Israel and her being reborn as a nation in 1948 has always been taught as one of the biggest signs of Christ's return. But what about the covenant nation of America? Why aren't we looking at that as part of a sign of the end times? We'll be addressing that issue and a whole lot more today on Prophecy USA. Stay with us. Welcome back, folks. We're discussing a very crucial end time sign today that many traditional prophecy teachers continue to mislead the body of Christ on. That sign is America's role in Bible prophecy. Now, last week we learned that the word providential means a nation or person that's raised up by divine utterance or mandate. In other words, the Word of God speaks about that providential nation before it even exists. Such is the case with America. You might remember that the prophet Daniel said, it's God who removes kings and raises up others. We discovered this truth last week and established eight specific nations throughout history that the Bible spoke about even before they existed. As a quick review, the first was established in Genesis 15:13 when God said, Thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. This was spoken to Abraham. So the first providential nation in Scripture was Egypt. The second was Assyria. Through the help of Nebuchadnezzar's dream of a golden image, Daniel prophesied about Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and the Roman Empire. However, there are two more kingdoms left to appear on planet Earth before Jesus returns, and it will amaze you when we begin to describe that seventh nation, so stay tuned. Throughout the ages, Bible prophecy has foretold of major empires who would rise and fall. The first six providential nations historically recorded in Scripture have been Egypt in 1500 BC, Assyria around 722 BC, Babylon in 605 BC represented by the golden head of the statue in the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, which was interpreted by the prophet Daniel. Medo-Persia, depicted by the statue's silver chest, the bronze thighs which was Greece in 331 BC, and the iron legs representing the Roman Empire in 168 BC. Since these nations have already come and gone according to the book of Revelation, there are only two more providential nations yet to rise. They are depicted in Revelation 17 as a woman sitting on the beast with seven heads and ten horns. The seven heads represent seven mountains or land masses on which the beast sits, but also represents the seven kings that we have just mentioned and have risen and fallen throughout history. According to scripture, the water which the beast rises up from represents multitudes, nations, and peoples. The people come from what the Bible describes as the sea of humanity and the seven heads represent the land masses on which they dwell. The ten horns represent ten kings who will join the beast and together they will form the eighth or last kingdom to rule over the earth before Christ returns. However, sitting on the beast is a woman, as the Greek word kathamia states, will police or rule over the beast before he comes into power. She is therefore the seventh nation out of the eight prophesied. The name of this woman is called Babylon the Great. After the flood, the descendants of Ham moved to the area of the Euphrates River in present-day Iraq. It was here they formed a city-nation called Babylon. It was also here that the pagan Babylonian religions were formed that still impact our societies today. 
And it was here also where the Lord confounded the speech of the Babylonians as they built the Tower of Babel towards the heavens, trying to establish themselves as God. In 620 BC, Babylon was rebuilt by King Nebuchadnezzar. He provided a mirror image of the power and wealth that the final Babylonian woman would possess. It was here in historical Babylon where the infamous story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego took place. Historical Babylon fell in 539 BC. But according to scripture, her religious practices will test the faith of believers once again in the latter day Babylon the Great. And miraculously, it is prophesied that the fourth man will once again deliver his people. The vast majority of people within Babylon do not believe scripture. Only those who have ears to hear will be able to recognize this woman that the Bible describes as Mystery Babylon. Welcome back, folks. You know, the actual words America, USA, or Canada are certainly not found in Scripture. But of course, neither are the words Trinity, Rapture, or Christian for that matter. However, the description of those terms are vividly explained and were later coined in their terminology. The same can be said for the mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. She's not named specifically, but she is vividly described as a major sign of the latter days. Now we know that the New World Order is not here yet. We also know that the United Nations 2030 agenda wants a godless one world government by the year 2030. As just described in our documentary, we also know that the Bible describes the coming New World Order as the eighth and final kingdom to rule on earth before Christ's return. So before we have an eighth nation manifest its presence, the Bible promises us God would manifest the seventh nation first. And if that seventh nation exists today, she would definitely be a providential nation divinely structured to meet every description of the woman who is called Mystery Babylon the Great. The traditional concept that the seventh and eight nations are both active during the tribulation period just emphasizes that 500-year-old myths and speculation have no place in prophecy. God is precise. He does not leave us guessing. When the appointed time for His word to be fulfilled comes into play, even the simplest of people can see it. You don't need a university degree and titles in front of your name to understand prophecy. The word Exegesis is a theological term that somewhat examines what is in the mind of the author at the time of its writing then and there. In simple terms, the theological term hermeneutics attempts to interpret what was said then and there and what it means to us in the here and now. Now you may recall that Daniel was told to shut the books of his writing because it was sealed until the time of the end. And by this understanding, we can see that the seventh providential nation was termed a mystery, as in Mystery Babylon the Great, because at the time of John's prophecy in approximately 90 AD, the future was a mystery. In fact, people did not even know the world was around. Most could not even read. Christopher Columbus and the nation of Spain was not even in existence. None of the disciples, including John, realized that it would take 2,000 years before a nation would be right, raised up to solve the mystery of Babylon the Great. They only knew one thing, that God had spoken it, and providentially, through divine intervention, God would someday make his word come to pass. The first sign that America is in the Bible is the mandate that she must be a providential nation. The very first president of the United States, George Washington, said this, it's the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly implore His protection and favor. The third president, Thomas Jefferson, said, and can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we've removed their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God, that they are not to be violated, but with His wrath, 
Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. John Quincy, the sixth president, stated this, Is it not that the Declaration of Independence first organized the social compact on the foundation of the Redeemer's mission upon the earth, that it laid the cornerstone of human government upon the first precepts of Christianity? Theodore Roosevelt, the 26th president, said the teachings of the Bible are so interwoven and entwined within our whole civic and social life that it would be literally impossible for us to figure to ourselves what life would be if these teachings were removed. In 1844, the United States Supreme Court made the unanimous decision encouraging the use of the Bible in state-run schools. Why may not the Bible, and especially the New Testament, without note or comment, be read and taught as a divine revelation in schools? Its general precepts expounded, its evidences explained, and its glorious principles of morality inculcated. Where can the purest principles of morality be learned so clearly and so perfectly as from the New Testament? From the Senate Judiciary Committee report of January 1853, it says, We are a Christian people, not because the law demands it, not to gain exclusive benefits or to avoid legal disabilities, but from choice and education, and in a land thus universally Christian, what is to be expected, what desired, but that we shall pay due regard to Christianity. James Wilson, the original signer of the Declaration of Independence, said, Human law must rest its authority upon the authority of the law which is divine. Far from being rivals or enemies, religion and law are twin sisters, friends, and mutual assistance indeed. These are two sciences run into each other. So clear is the biblical foundation of the United States that at its highest peak in the Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C., is the statue of Moses holding the Ten Commandments. Now, it's abundantly clear that the U.S. was established providentially on the Judeo-Christian faith. But unfortunately, what many don't realize today are the many benefits that came from those faith-based foundations. The Bible says that Abraham was a man who found favor with God. And God told Abraham that because of his righteousness, he would birth out of Abraham a great nation, a chosen people who would establish God's moral laws upon the earth. And those who blessed Abraham would be blessed by God, and those who cursed Abraham would be cursed by God. The children of Israel, known as the 12 tribes of Israel, came from the loins of Abraham. But it was not until Moses' ministry, some 450 years later, that God revealed a clear understanding of what his covenant with Abraham could do for his offspring. The definition of covenant means a mutual agreement between two individuals who agree to meet each other's obligations so both can receive equal benefits. In Psalms, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. A covenant made with God always invokes benefits of divine provision, guidance, and protection from the Father. Now, whether the Founding Fathers of America knew it or not, they, in fact, were providentially fulfilling a covenant that was made within the Mayflower Compact when the pilgrims arrived in 620 A.D. In that compact, the pilgrims invoked with their words a covenant with God, having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and mutually in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic, promising that this newfound land would be governed upon the principles of the Bible. And at the same time, because of their faith, the founding fathers invoke God's benefits within the constitution of divine provision, guidance, and protection of God's people. Deuteronomy 
28, 1 through 15, Moses listed the blessings or the benefits that would be invoked upon Israel if she followed God's covenant. However, the Bible does not apply its laws and tenets just to Israel. Israel was created to be an example to other nations. But those blessings that were promised to Israel apply to any nation or any person who is willing to follow its tenets. Deuteronomy 28, Moses penned the following blessings that would come from a covenant with God. If you faithfully obey the voice of God, God will set you high above all the nations. And all the blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord. Blessed shall you be in the city and in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of the ground and the fruit of your cattle. Blessed shall your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before you. They'll come against you one way and flee seven ways. The Lord will command the blessings upon your barns and in all that he will overtake. And he will bless you in the land that the Lord is giving you. The Lord will establish you a people if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. You will abound in prosperity. Your womb and the fruit of your livestock will bear fruit. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. Wow. Have you ever wondered why we in North America are so blessed? Have you ever considered the fact that America's laws, schools, governments were founded upon the written covenants of God, making declarations of faith to God, and those direct declarations invoke divine benefits of prosperity? Perhaps you might think our prosperity is based on capitalism. Well, if you do, you're correct. But did you know that capitalism is based on biblical principles? The Bible says if a man will not work, then he shall not eat. The Bible says that God wishes above all things that you prosper and be in health. The Bible says, given it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give unto your bosom. God places seed in the hand of the sower, and he multiplies the seed sown and increases the fruits of your righteousness. You see, the nearest helping hand of God is usually found at the end of your own wrist. Now, I heard the story of a man who in his later years of retirement bought himself a brand new car. A Christian neighbor came over and looked at that car and sarcastically said, I wonder how many families you could have fed with how much you paid for that car. The man pondered the question and said, well, I don't know how many families I could have fed, but I know the engineers who designed the car got paid, the 250 men on the assembly line who put it together got paid, and I personally know that the dealer got paid because I paid him. Every person who got paid worked hard to give me exactly what I wanted, and they deserved every penny because I love my sports car. You know, the divine principles written in America's economic policies and their declaration that all men were created equal and that they be endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights and that among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness has allowed America to fulfill her providential role in Bible prophecy. This lady of kingdoms has certainly been a golden cup in the hand of the Lord. But for those of you who have ears to hear and hearts to understand, there's much, much more to unveil concerning this lady of mystery. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Theological seminaries have inundated churches preaching that America is not in the Bible. Prophecy teachers have regurgitated for years that America is not in the Bible. But what does the Bible say? Prophecy USA is proud to present a 30-page brochure filled with scripture, debunking the biggest lie keeping the body of Christ in darkness today. America is fully detailed in scripture over 53 times, and now we want to put God's word directly into your hands. 
America's role in Bible prophecy is rapidly being fulfilled and her judgment is coming. For a gift of $15 plus shipping and handling, we will send you this amazing brochure. For a gift of $50, we will send you five brochures. For $100 or more, we will rush to you 10 brochures. And for a ministry gift of $500, we will send you both our books, The Hour That Changes Everything, and The Coming Exodus, plus 20 brochures for your friends, family, and relatives. Call today. Welcome back, folks. You know, so far today, we learned of how the founding fathers of the United States of America mirrored the divine principles into her foundation as Moses laid out for the covenant nation of Israel. We also learned that the same benefits that God promised Israel are available to any nation or person who is willing to follow those biblical principles. And those benefits of blessing come from being in covenant with God and they evoke His provision, His guidance, and His protection. But how does this fit into America's role in Bible prophecy? It fits into prophecy because when the angel spoke to John of Babylon the Great then and there, it was a mystery to him. No nation like that existed at the time of John's writing, including Rome, whose symbol was the mythical she-wolf who suckled the twin brother Romulus and Remus. In fact, no nation has ever fulfilled this description in world history until now. Just as Daniel's prophecies said, seal the book until the time of the end, so John's description of Babylon the Great would be sealed then and there, but easily identified 2,000 years later in the here and now. But unfortunately, not everyone in the last days will have ears to hear. False prophets will continue to prophesy to those who have itching ears, telling folks what they want to hear instead of what the Word of God actually says. And traditional prophecy teachers and prophecy seminars will continue to speculate who or where Mystery Babylon will appear. The same prophets who were rejected by religious experts then and there will also be rejected by academically accredited experts here and now. Nothing's ever changed when it comes to hearing God's voice and discerning the signs of the times. John in 90 AD, Jeremiah in 620 BC, and Isaiah in 750 BC gave us over 50 descriptions of this lady of kingdoms, Babylon the Great, as far back as 2750 years ago. So let those who have ears to hear, hearts to discern, and wisdom to understand, listen to these simple descriptions of Latter-day Babylon. She must appear before the New World Order arrives. The New World Order is not here yet, but America is. She's still a mystery. We have easily established who the first six kingdoms were because they have come and gone. Hindsight's always 2020. However, the minds of those steeped in tradition the seventh kingdom still remains a mystery. Some teach that historical Babylon will once again be erected in Iraq. Others still believe it's Rome because Rome is a city of seven hills, not mountains. Others speculate Babylon the city is yet to be built and will rule during the tribulation period, which is a false time sequence of scripture, which we will prove to you in upcoming programs. Every generation has had theological differences. When Jesus Christ asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? Some said Elijah, others said a great prophet. But Peter said that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus responded, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, Peter, but my father is who is in heaven. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Jesus was not talking about Peter the rock. He was talking about divine revelation knowledge when God speaks directly to an individual. And that revelation knowledge has progressed throughout the centuries and knowledge has increased just as Daniel prophesied. However, Jesus was rejected by the most studied theologians of his time. They were called scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees. They were well-meaning people who studied scripture diligently, 
but they totally missed the revelation knowledge of who Jesus was. They quoted the prophets, but they missed the greatest prophet in all the Bible standing right in front of them. They actually studied the book and then rejected the author. Today, Jesus will speak directly to anyone who has ears to hear his still small voice. He's our savior, but he is also your personal high priest and prophet. Nobody can stand between you and God. Listen in your heart to see what the Holy Spirit says to you as we show you multiple prophetic descriptions of Babylon the Great. The Holy Spirit will not lie, but he will quicken you when his truth is being revealed. Remember, the secret things belong to God, but the things he reveals unto us belong to us and to our children. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the glory of kings to search it out. And we believe at Prophecy USA that Babylon's appointed time has come to be revealed to our generation. And we're going to help you search this mystery out. The seventh kingdom must be a providential nation. And history proves that the founding fathers of the United States invoke God's providential influence firmly into her constitution. Even the U.S. currency boldly states, in God we trust. She must be symbolized as a woman. Number five, she must be a major influence around the world. The woman sits on the seven mountains of the world. And today we talked about five of 53 biblical descriptions pointing to the United States. But as time progresses, many more Babylonian descriptions are manifesting. Think about America as a covenant with God and the blessings they've invoked upon the land. The woman upon the beast is draped in riches, rubies, and decadent clothing. All these images point to a nation that is abundant in riches. Remember something very important in the weeks and months to come as we unveil the mystery to you that many people, including traditional prophecy teachers and academic Bible scholars, will laugh, mock, and scoff at the concept of America being Babylon. Remember, the majority of people in Babylon, including many of the, those teaching the Bible, refuse to believe the prophetic warnings concerning Babylon's description and fulfill the very words that they themselves deny. For she says in her heart, I sit a queen, I am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Many teachers speak a word that itching ears want to hear today instead of repeating the word that God has already spoken. As America continues to fill fulfill prophecy, the wheat and the chaff will separate between those who have ears to hear and those who don't. So let's pray that the Holy Spirit will speak clearly to us. But we're out of time, folks. Join us next week as we continue to unveil the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. My name's Rick Pearson, reminding you, Jesus is alive and he's coming back much sooner than many people think. We'll see you next week on Prophecy USA. Shalom.